Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kent. Uh, good afternoon to uh, um, everyone in the Third World uh, <coughs> Study Center. I am also a graduate of uh, the University of the Philippines. Uh, way back in, I will not tell you when what that was, but that was uh, some time ago. Uh, so I, without further, uh, thank you very much, Professor Kent, for the very nice introduction. And I'm very, 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 very happy to be in Afrasia, to be part of Afrasia. Um, so today's, uh, my topic for today is about regional development in the Philippines, as well as uh, in relation to um, migrant uh, initiatives on social entrepreneurship. Um, so this is how we do this. So uh, I will I'll give you a brief introduction of the trends in um, migration in the Philippines. Probably uh, uh, Dr. Assis at uh, Scalabrini's uh, center probably knows more about this because my background is not really migration. I'm more of uh, regional development. Uh, so I would, I'm very, very thankful that you are here to listen to this um, very amateurish talk on migration. I would like to link, I would like to examine the link between international migration and local uh, regional development, particularly in the Philippine setting, and if possible, try to go into the initiatives, the social entrepreneurial initiatives that are being done by uh, community groups, by uh, uh, organizations, local organizations that are trying to help uh, migrants in the Philippines and uh, uh, find some conclusions and some policy recommendations based on this very brief analysis. Uh, these are some uh, the latest data on um, uh, migrants, uh, where the migrants are going right now, Filipinos uh, who, are, who uh, uh, want to uh, work abroad. Uh, the USA is course, it's always been the perennial uh, destination of um, workers or professionals and uh, Filipinos who go abroad. Um, uh, there are probably, uh, right now there are more than like um, 10 million, I think, Filipinos working abroad and it's like 5% of total um, migrant workers <coughs> in the world. Um, this would be a, a better um, think, um, graphical uh, picture of the data. Um, and I want to look at this data because I want to show how that um, actually some of the Filipinos actually are very sensitive to global shocks. You would see that um, in 1997 to 1998, when we had the Asian financial crisis, the uh, the Filipinos who went want to go abroad actually went down, dipped. And there are dips in the uh, data, and you you would these would coincide with the uh, Asian financial crisis and the global uh, uh, the Lehman shock in um, that started in the U.S. and that was around um, when was this the 97 to 98 and from 2006 to 2008 and both. If you look at the breakdown between males and females, the both uh, males and female workers were actually uh, very sensitive to this uh, external shocks. Um, and uh, we want to look also into uh, what kind of work they get abroad, they find abroad, and I looked at data 2011, 2012, and like five year intervals, and we see a bit of a a difference within this the recent five years. Uh, recent five years, uh, so recently in 2012, there's been a decrease in permanent. Uh, seems to be there is, and there have been more. Uh, sorry, sorry, there's been an increase in permanent, um, slight, very slight increase in permanent <coughs> workers. There's been a decrease in temporary workers, but there's been a large increase on uh, irregular workers, or um, uh, irregular workers are those workers who are <coughs> um, undocumented and um, undocumented and lack the proper paperwork to validate their stay for overstaying overseas. Um, but if you see here that 
um, temporary workers have actually decreased uh, by 6% from 2011 to 2012. Um, and that's very different from what happened like five years ago when there's been an increase in 2006 to 2007. Um, and we I kind of think that um, they're very sensitive to global trends in the world market, but when it when they do leave, they are very uh, risk loving or they're risk takers in the job market, even though they, there are no available jobs in abroad in their destination, they still leave and they try to um, be adventurous in that kind of uh, uh, sense. So the permanent, immig uh, per permanent migrants are those who are um, they, are, they include the immigrants, these are the people who uh, don't, who uh, stay abroad or are not connected with uh, work contract. And uh, temporary migrants are those who uh, leave because they have work contracts and these include um, businessmen, trainees, as well as the students who are expected to return back to the Philippines. Um, again, so this is the geographical. Um, uh, breakdown of where the Filipinos are going uh, 1981 to 2012 uh, we have again the USA being very uh, a lot of the Filipinos going to the USA and a lot of um, because of probably the presence of uh, uh, their family members and their um, uh, the language also the familiarity and culture, but uh, and, near, and uh, Canada is the nearby, the second uh, destination of uh, uh, popular among Filipino immigrants. Um, and we, I looked also at recent data, and we look at um, from 1981 to 2012. If you take um, the if you take a compound uh, annual growth rate of these uh, for the past 31 years of immigrants, actually the, those going to the USA have actually been declining. If you make it, if you smoothen, okay, over the 31 years, if you smoothen that over the 31 years, it's been very, it's been declining by less than a one percentage point. Um, Canada increasing by 2% every year from 1981 to 2012. But there's this place where a lot of Filipinos seem to be going out, jumped from four in 1981 to 2012, uh, to, to 3,818 in 2012. Um, so we, the aphrasia was very much interested in finding out more about uh, why the Filipinos or why the, the, the migrant Filipino workers are going to Italy. And we actually went to Santa Rosa, La Luna, uh, earlier last year in 2013 in February. We visited Little Italy, this very uh, small village town in uh, Santa Rosa and they, we saw all the houses, very large houses owned by Filipinos who were working in Italy and they built these houses using their savings um, uh, and uh, they just come home once or twice a year when there's a fiesta or a holiday back home and somebody is taking care of the house for them while they are working abroad. The houses that they built are really very, uh, yes, we, we yeah. saw the houses, yes. Um, and uh, we thought, wow, why they use all their savings uh, and build this? Why do they use all this, their savings to build large houses, which end up being used only once a year? And uh, I kind of felt that for these migrant workers, they, we, I tried to find the reason probably, it's not just because they have, um, because of their contract, but they, it will end and they have to come back, 
But I think it's more if you try to look into their, the, they have a choice actually whether they would stay, be, stay abroad or go back, but it's probably because of these uh, factors, the presence of social network support, the familiar culture back home, um, the, the source of career and personal growth, that they feel that there's this built-in uh, built sense of place and sense of pride that they prefer uh, to, to, to go back home. Uh, they identify with the people and the, of course, customs back home. And so the need to belong to back where they come from is uh, something that could induce consumption and investment behavior in a place. Um, if we look into the um, study of uh, Ralph, a uh, geographer in the University of Toronto way back in 1976, tried to find the reasons why um, uh, uh, people identify uh, with a place. But uh, Professor Ralph actually uh, distinguished between identity, identity of a place and identity with a place. And it's, if it's the identity of a place, it's about places, physical setting, activities, situations, events that happen in that place, uh, the, the meanings that people and groups create with experiences and intentions regarding regard to that place probably build that identity of the place and how people identify with the place would be this feelings of insideness and outsideness how people attach, get attached to a place, their involvement in the place, and, um, and on the other hand, outsideness could be the sense of strangeness that you feel uh, when a newcomer comes in, there's the alienation. <coughs> at the same time, when you come back, after a long time being abroad, you come back and you feel that there is also a feeling of outsideness after that. So these probably are some reasons that could explain how from a migrant, you can combat how uh, either a, a person becomes a returning or an immigrant in the destination. And this is, um, if you break it down into big group categories like preferences, you, a migrant would prefer place X to place Y, or and how in different stages would eventually identify with that place and try to belong to that place and strong urge to belong to that in that place would actually induce this uh, consumption and investment behavior for long-term settlement. Um, and I call this the sense of place, which I based in uh, on Professor Ralph's um, um, framework on place and placelessness. Um, since I come from economics, I try to infer this uh, preferring a certain place uh, to another by reveal, using the revealed preference theory. And um, in revealed, uh, when you say that you reveal, uh, you prefer a certain place or a certain thing to something else, then you have, you can't be in, you can't consume the same, two things at the same time. So that it has to be a unique choice, it has to be a unique bundle of goods that you consume in one place. Um, so that we just need to, sorry, we just need to get that um, uh, concept straight that um, choices have to be unique. Uh, the, the bundles or the goods that are chosen should be uh, either in, uh, yeah, in, in one place. You know, it can't be, you can't have yeah, you're, you can't eat your uh, you can't have your cake and eat it too. Yes, that's, that's what they said. So this is how I try to put together the revealed preference theory and consumer choice in economics and the sense of place of how what determines returnees and um, immigrants. You would see um, where is up here. Um, um, I have this uh, the the middle part of the graph would be oh, the outset of, or the onset of migration. And um, it's, when they migrate, some, some people, most Filipinos probably, would be sending back 
remittances. I will be sending money back home um, uh, to support their families also. But in, in one way, they, it's also a way of uh, investing back home. Um, but they're actually already in the destination or in the host country. So I would call those uh, instances when they invest or consume or send money back home as like slight, oh, I didn't put the bifurc bifurcation points. Those are points that do not um, follow the revealed preference theory, but they prefer because of this. Um, I try to combine the sense of place and the revealed preference um, theory. They, it would seem that they are in one place, but they still prefer to be in that place it, when, it, when you look at their consumption and investment patterns. Um, the red side of the, the um, a graph would only show for um, immigrants. So if they return, you only see that that part. Sorry, I I don't know how to <laughs> erase that part. Um, you own so that big red black. Oh, sorry, I should do this right. That <laughs> that big red um, point here is the point where for um, the deciding point, decisive point for uh, immigrants uh, to immigrate to go. Uh, and invest abroad and stay and permanently stay abroad. But for returnees, you only see this blue part of the of the graph. Then when they actually eventually go back home and resettle back home. So you don't see this part of the graph for the returnees. But they are actually they already migrate already, but they're still actually consuming and investing back home. So these are these points here, what I call the bifurcation points, where they actually are in a different um, region already, but they consume or invest for region uh, X or where you're home. And so um, why, why do the migrants return home? I tried to look into the literature, and I saw uh, Louise Million's um, uh, dissertation, which he did, which she did on um, uh, using the experience of uh, Canadians, but not migrants. They were not migrants, but they were um, family who were displaced. Families who were displaced because of uh, construction of uh, dam in uh, southern Alberta. So they, the, and she examined how what the experience of these families, um, and and. Uh, um, named this uh, eight stages of involuntary displacement, which can probably be uh, used also for um, overseas contract workers who are, uh, well, you can't really say involuntarily displaced, but they are, because of lack of uh, jobs available back home, they have to seek employment elsewhere and um, eventually go back. And so, But the first would be stages when they do leave, they become, I think they would probably identify with these stages, they become uneasy, they, they have struggle, they struggle to stay, and they have to accept the uh, environment uh, overseas, and then they try to secure a place to settle, and then searching for new things, and starting over, and then the unsettling reminders that, oh, I actually do not belong here, and they want to resettle back home. So I find like a bit of a, a strong coincidence in these in this um, eight stage um, stage uh, framework for involuntary displacement. Um, so I try to look at these to the uh, on this uh, uh, using this framework to distinguish between potential returnees and uh, immigrants because. I want to establish the point that the returnees are those who can be actual um, contributors to local development back home. It's not the immigrants, but it would be the uh, the returnees who would um, be able to contribute to local development and the link between international migration and local development. Um, so. Um, 
So in turn, what are the prerequisites? Now we go to the next part of uh, the, the part of the component of the paper would be uh, looking into the prerequisites that would link international migration and uh, regional development. So there's a need for capital resource mobilization, which is the main reason why uh, the migrants are um, can actually help with the uh, uh, the need for uh, local development. Uh, they can have this uh, acquired uh, know-how which they um, got back in the uh, abroad, and their um, ease with the community networks. And with that, they will be able to uh, also facilitate the, um, creating businesses and probably in, uh, jobs also back home, and also for revitalized local industry development. Um, the thing is, for Little Italy, though we talked with the local government officials, the barangay officials in uh, Santa Rosa, and they mentioned that uh, agriculture is probably the uh, most uh, affected, adversely affected industry by migration. Most of the family members were left behind. Um, they have work experience. They have experience in the agricultural sector, but they um, actually do not um, reinvest the remittances that are being sent back home into agriculture for some reason. Uh, they go more into um, consumption of uh, consumption of durables and um, more into final consumption than into um, production. So uh, there is a need to the the barangay officials over there told us that there's a need. They find the need to channel uh, migrant resources towards improving agricultural industry as a as very important. Um, and so we did a case study and we also visited the Atika uh, office. Uh, this office in Laguna, also based in Laguna, and their uh, activities are all uh, involve uh, communities in Laguna. Uh, um, uh, they provide uh, economic and social services to overseas Filipinos and their families, and but they also try to uh, mobilize resources towards the development of the communities that are affected by migrant workers. Um, and these are the various activities that they are uh, involved with, uh, financial literacy programs, uh, also they are involved in um, um, facilitating um, this uh, SIDSI. Uh, uh, what's SIDSI? I forgot. It's Ibaba. It's, it's uh, oh, I forgot the, what's the, oh, oh it's SIDSI is there. Oh, yeah, so sorry, sorry, Ibaba Development Cooperative, <laughs> right. <laughs> yes, so the, the, those are the places in, I think this is in Batangas, right? Ibaba, Batangas. <laughs> Yeah, in Soro Soro Batangas, where they started this um, um, cooperative. Um, and uh, they try to link also. At, so Atika doesn't just um, provide so psychosocial uh, services for the migrants and their families, but it also tries to link communities with national and local government agencies, which I think is a very, very um, uh, vital uh, part of their work that they're doing in uh, revitalizing regional development. So this is the whole spectrum of what they're trying to do. They're, they're involved with migrants and families. Uh, they're involved with connect, linking with other non-government agencies, with financial institutions uh, and cooperatives and the private sector and the no national government authorities, the local government units. And uh, the others here would include the uh, migrant um, migrant organizations abroad, who are also in, uh, Atika is also trying to reach out to migrant um, migrant uh, organizations abroad, so that they will be able to link migrants overseas and the families 
uh, that are left behind. Uh, so among their psychosocial and economic services, they, have, uh, they provide counseling for individuals, for groups and families. They also have livelihood and skills training, which includes uh, how, how families left behind can start their own businesses, um, can improve their computer literacy skills, um, and other um, ways to explore uh, cottage industry development. And so they also have um, uh, services for uh, the children, the, the spouses that are left behind, and, and the caretakers. Um, they also have, um, uh, with the, we met, um, we met uh, Ms. Anya Nuevo, who was very, uh, very spirited, uh, see, see a powerful yes, CEO. Uh, it's very small and real, but they they do all these things, and we were really very very surprised that at the at the uh, effective implementation of their uh, of their programs. You know? So they have social services uh, assistance to uh, uh, overseas Filipino workers who are who need help. So they also give, they do networking um, uh, work, also meeting with um, uh, other partner agencies. Um, and the second part of their work is really this linking with uh, local governments and um, other uh, authorities you know, involved in policy making, which uh, I think is very, very important in trying to um, uh, effectively implement the programs that they're trying to do at the grassroots level, but trying to be able to coordinate with uh, policymakers is very important for um, making these things actually work. You know, the what the activities you know, to have long-lasting um, effect and impact. Uh, they have training also for not only for. Uh, the OFWs uh, for the overseas Filipino workers, but also for the families. Uh, and they have developed also research centers, so they have uh, computer, uh, computer, um, uh, how does it say? Um, computer classes in their, in Atika. They give computer classes in Atika also, and they organize um, these meetings with various stakeholders, cooperatives, thank you very much, yes. And the last uh, is uh, um, one example that I can say that their um, social enterprise initiative of Atika is the ecotourism of Lake Pandin. Uh, this is um, also led by Atika, but it is run by local women's organization and employ the women in the community. So what they do is uh, they organize tours around this very placid lake. Uh, they prepare the food. They um, they prepare the food, the delicacies, the local delicacies in that area, and. Uh, and they paddle along up around the lake, and all of this are being done by the women. Uh, even these are the women who are trying to um, host hosted the, the lunch, and the, those are us behind um, feasting on the uh, the uh, this delicacies. Yes. So the conclusions and policy recommendations that I can. I get from this very brief study is we know we have linked that uh, the migrant returnees through revealed preferences and the propensity to invest back home. These are the people who can be tapped to contribute to development. Uh, the local based groups with the social entrepreneurship uh, entrepreneurial initiatives are also potential enablers that can actually mobilize uh, not only the savings but also uh, groups and the people back home to uh, contribute to um, re uh, local development, but there is a need for public and private partnership initiatives, and there's also a need to implement the programs that will prepare the migrants for reintegration when they do go back home. So, thank you very much. Uh, these are the references, and thank you very much. Thank you.
slide, I don't know which one, the real preference theory and the one after that. Yes. This uh, blue and red. Yes, yes. I just couldn't read it well actually myself because of my lack of knowledge actually. The red part, you have the the left part, source and home, you have destination and host. And yes. how, how can you explain a little bit more? Or can you do it later maybe? Yeah. Um, or the blue part, the first half part. Thank you, that one, yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, a bit more how they okay they they go to the destination ah yes after the, in the second half but the early half how they manage to take the graph actually because back yes. it is in the country they are not in the uh, hosting country and how they decide how they become the migrants how they become immigrants oh, okay sorry, sorry. I was able yeah, to explain uh, that the vertical yes. axis here actually measures uh, gives an um, indication of the sense of place you know? so. Um, when they leave, the way it's like, this is the origin, that's zero over there, you know? and they move overseas, but this, the sense of place that they have, which we, we defined earlier as uh, familiarity with the place, uh, um, being with uh, personal, uh, being with family and friends, you know, I, still is like a very low compared to in time this would probably increase with a sense of place and when it reaches that point over there which is a bit it may reach a point that coincides with the vertical axis over here mm -hmm. they will eventually go back home mm -hmm. so the sense of place the sense degree of identification with the place and preferring a place would be uh, would coincide with the decision to either return back home or to immigrate, stay overseas. But eventually, while they do that, they are actually investing, mm -hmm. investing more. So it's the direction, this is just the direction, also the direction of where best they invest um, in their destination or in the host destination country, or do they invest back home? Um, and it's just, yes, trying to distinguish between the returnees and the uh, immigrants, more or less, yes. And I try to co uh, put them together in one, mm -hmm. yes. No, it's very nice. Yeah. Thank you to see whatever we thought is in this one graph. Is yes, nice. yeah, thank you very much. Thank yes, you. you're welcome. Do <laughs> you have any other questions? The program specifies that there's going to be a section on the forum regarding the Okay. All right, then we'll go on to the second floor. Okay. Uh,